Good morning, Neighborhood Church family. So thankful you are here to worship with us. As you're able, if you'll stand as I read Psalm 28, 7 over us. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song, I will praise him. So dear Lord, let it be true that your name will be honored today, Lord. May it be honored because the hearts of those who are gathered want to celebrate the joy of knowing Jesus. We thank you that if we have believed and received your son, Jesus, we have life in your presence forever. That is something to have great joy and great celebration about, Lord. I thank you that we can join here this morning in a spirit of joy that we've already been praying for the spirit to stir up, Lord, that we can join with that spirit of joy and point each other to you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, there is joy in this house today. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. you Lord we worship the God who was we worship the God who is we worship the God who evermore will be he opened the prison door he parted the raging sea my God he holds the victory Lord, our God is surely in this place, and 
So how can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved.
passage from John 14. So if you guys want to turn to John 14 with me, you can grab your phone or your Bible. These were some of the last words that Jesus told to his disciples. And he said in verse 14, he said, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. 21 says, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. We're going to go to 23, and it says, Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. I am telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate, as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit. He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. 27 says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I have told you. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, sing with me, Holy Spirit.
the air, the atmosphere with your spirit, Lord. Your glory, it's your glory. God, is what our hearts, our hearts long for you to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Yes, Lord, may it be true that our hearts are tender and ready to receive the word. Your spirit is welcome here and you are here moving among us. So in this moment right now, keep doing your work. Keep doing your work in the hearts of the believers here, Lord. Tenderize our hearts. Break the chains that keep us from that closeness to you. Keep leaning us closer to your heart that will be more and more in tune, more and more apt to remain in you, Lord. Do the work in this room now, Lord. We believe for it. We trust you for it, Lord. Lord, you are so good. And I love it when Jen reminds us when she prays over us that we stand under a waterfall, under a waterfall of your goodness, of your grace, of your love. May we be experiencing that now, Lord. And because we so deeply know and acknowledge your love, may we be willing, fully willing to participate in your kingdom work and to pour out that love into those around us who need to know you. We love you. We thank you for Neighborhood Church where we have the beautiful pleasure and privilege of coming together from our different backgrounds, from our different days, from our different nights, from different stress levels, that we can come together with what's ever on our heart and mind and that you can bind them one heart and one mind for the glory of your name when we focus on you. May our eyes be full on your wonderful face. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And my neighborhood kids, friends, you are dismissed to go have fun downstairs. Well, good morning and welcome to Neighborhood Church. We're glad you're here with us. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. We're glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, for any of you who may not know me, my name is Tim. Uh, I'm the director of student ministries here at Neighborhood Church, and uh, I'm sure you've heard this before, and hopefully you've heard it a lot. Um, but here at Neighborhood Church, we are a gathering of people who want to be transformed by Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and launched on mission with God as he reaches lost people. And we have a passion here at Neighborhood Church to see people say yes to Jesus for the first time. And one of the ways that we celebrate this is through these light boxes. You'll see two up here uh, that are lit, and they have names and phrases on them. These are representations of people who are connected with our church who have said yes to Jesus. If you take a look along the walls, you'll see more light boxes that are dark. Our desire and our hope is that over the year, these boxes get lit. Again, because we have a passion to see people say yes to Jesus for the first time. And we want to see this not because we want to boast about ourselves and say, oh, neighborhood church, we're so good. Uh, look at all these people that we've brought to Christ. But no, we want to boast and celebrate that the kingdom of God is growing. And so one thing I don't want you to hear this morning is like, uh, it's up to you to light these boxes. So I'm, I'm not saying this out of pressure. I'm not saying this out of anything negative. But I'm saying it as a reminder as to why we have these on here. And I'm also saying it as a celebration. Because this past week, we had two people connected with Neighborhood Church say their first yes to Jesus. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. So the lighting of their boxes and their stories are, are forthcoming, um, but I had the privilege to share with you guys this morning uh, that wonderful news, and it's really exciting. Um, so before we dive in this morning, let me just take a moment and pray. Lord, I thank you that you are on the move, that you are still transforming lives, that you are still drawing people closer to you. And Lord, that's our desire this morning, that we would show up here eager to be transformed by you and your spirit. 
Lord, we want to draw closer to you. Lord, we know the text this morning, or I know the text this morning, is not an easy text. But God, you are still a good God, and you stand true, and your love and your grace and your passion for each one of us still remain strong. So Lord, protect us from deception. Fill us with your spirit. Give us ears to listen to your word. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this morning we're continuing in our series of First John. Over the past couple of weeks we've started a series uh, where we're looking at the book of First John. Jen kicked it off for us a, a few weeks ago, and this last week we had an amazing message from uh, Eric Peacock, the wonderful drummer. Um, so if you missed any of those, I highly want to encourage you to, to go onto our website. Um, at the top of the page you can click connect and then messages, and then you can listen to all of the past messages from this series, but then any past series, like going years back. Um, I went on the page uh, earlier this week to just make sure I was telling you the right way to get there. Um, And this is a slight brag moment, uh, just because I can and she can't stop me right now. But um, it was an excellent time for me to marvel at my wife's work. Um, All of the sermon images that you see, including the one behind me, um, are created by her. She's the graphic designer for our church, and she does amazing work. And so, (laughs) I'll I'll hear it for for that later, but that's okay. Um, So yeah, I got to, you don't need to go and marvel at that work. That was was just what I did. I want you to go and listen to the messages. So make sure to to get on there and, and check that out. But First John series, if you missed any of them, be sure to go on and, and check them out. Um, but if you missed either the first week or, or maybe any of these weeks, I want to give you some context of, of the book of First John and, and who's writing it, who they're writing it to, why it's being written. I think that's important to do when we're, when we're diving through, through a text. So if we zoom out just for a second, we can see there's... First, second, and third John. Now, first John is actually written anonymously, but second and third John are written by someone called the Elder, which is, I want that nickname when I grow up. Just write that down. That's a sweet name. Um, it's written by someone called the Elder. The language and style of all three of these books are identical not only to each other, but to John's gospel. So it's generally understood or thought that these works come from the disciple that Jesus loved. Whoever it is, it is clear that this individual is probably older in age and is overseeing a network of house churches, most likely around the city of Ephesus. Through reading the text, it appears that most of these communities of house churches were made up of Jewish followers of Jesus and that they had recently gone through a crisis that motivated John, or the author, to write these letters. He mentions that a group of people have broken off from these churches, and they no longer acknowledge Jesus as Israel's Messiah or as the Son of God. And they're stirring up hostility among those who stayed faithful to the churches. This is where we jump into the text today. And before I jump in, I want to share a quick resource, which if you've ever heard me speak before, I'm pretty sure I talk about every time. Uh, And if you're one of our students, you know it for sure. But there's an organization called The Bible Project. Uh, It is an incredible, incredible resource. They have a website. You can also find them on YouTube. Uh, They do a uh, contextual breakdown of every book of the Bible. So it is great prior to reading a book, in the middle of reading a book, after reading a book. If you want some more context and understanding about what's going on, go to YouTube, look up Bible Project, and they've got a a video for you. They also have a ton of other videos and content, and it's very, very good. I might talk more about it later. So uh, the other thing I want to do before we dive into our text is give a very strong warning. This is not the easiest of texts this morning. 
I know last week uh, Eric gave the caveat that things are, that he was going to talk about, they're going to be a little tough. Uh, they might be uncomfortable. I would like to echo that caveat. There are going to be things we talk about this morning that might make you feel uncomfortable. You might start moving around in your chair a little bit. And that's okay. Truly, that's okay. Sometimes we need, <clears throat> sometimes we need to get a little uncomfortable. But I want to also remind you why this text is being written. If we jump ahead in 1 John and look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it states, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is a letter of encouragement, not discouragement. This is a letter of encouragement, not discouragement. The author is writing this to encourage, help strengthen, and lift up those who may be wrestling with discouragement caused by those who are walking away from their faith and from the church. So this morning, uh, we'll be taking a look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. Uh, if you have a physical Bible, I encourage you to take it out now. Um, you, we are also on the Version app or any Bible app, you can find this verse. Uh, so you can get out your technology stick things and bring up the verse there. Or uh, you can also look at the screen and follow along with us. So we're in 1 John chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 27, but we're going to start in chapter 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. You guys encouraged? Super fun text, right? Yeah, we get to talk about the Antichrist in the last hour. So, what does this mean? We're going to look at we're going to take a look at the, the, the full text, but I think it's important to know who or what is the Antichrist. There's this understanding in pop Christian culture, if you want to call it that, uh, from things like the Left Behind series or uh, other things like that, that give this depiction that the Antichrist is a single individual, most likely a politician or a leader of some sort, that ultimately leads people away from God. But we can see even in this text, it says many antichrists have come. So you see, the antichrist being re referenced here is not the same as the end times beings mentioned in Revelation, but instead truly anyone who spoke against Christ anyone who was anti-Christ. One who denies the Father and the Son, which we'll take a look at in just a few verses. This is how we know it is the last hour. To paraphrase the, the Benson commentary, this last hour is an expression used by the early Jewish church to refer to a period of time in which the Lord had foretold the rise of many false Christs. And the author here is warning against those same deceivers. So as we look at the text this morning, I believe the author is trying to make us aware of a war against deception. There is a war against deception. There is a battle going on, folks. Whether you're privy to it or not, there is a battle going on. And the author of 1 John is trying to bring some light to it. 
ladies and gentlemen, I don't care if you are two or 102. If you are living a life for Jesus and allowing your life to truly be transformed by Jesus, don't for one second think that that's going to go unnoticed. If you are living your life truly being transformed by God, it will not go unnoticed. And I'm not talking about your family and your friends and your coworkers. They might notice, and that's good. But if, you, if your life is truly being transformed and shaped by God, it will not go unnoticed by the enemy. Be aware of deception. John, the first part of John 10, 10, uh, Jesus says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Deception plays a major role in spiritual warfare. Deception plays a major role in spiritual warfare. And the first place we see this is in the garden. Satan came to deceive Eve. How many of you have pets? A few? See a few hands go up. Um, maybe cats, dogs, probably other pets, but let's just stick with cats and dogs for right now. Uh, we have a dog at home. Uh, he's a little annoying at the moment. We're not sure why. He's just scratching at everything and won't stop licking and it's annoying. Um, but we have a dog. His name's Hudson. He's a little guy. Um, don't tell him. He was a little bit of a disappointment for me. I'm a big dog person. My wife is a small dog person. He was supposed to be medium. He is not. He's 19 pounds. He's a little guy. So, uh, but he's got the energy of a big dog. So um, if, if we want to take Hudson on a walk, what do we have to do? We have to put a collar on, hook up a leash, and then we go, right? And that, that leash and that collar are there to help guide and, and direct where he can go and where he can't go, because otherwise he might run off, right? Maybe you have a cat, or maybe you don't have a cat, um, but maybe you've seen this before. Have you ever seen someone pick up a cat in a certain way that when they pick it up, it just goes stiff? It's like, well, this is happening. There's nothing I can do, right? How are they picking it up? It's by the extra skin or fur that's like at the back of the neck, right? Back shoulders, back of the neck, that general area, right? How many of you like snakes? We've got one, maybe. Um, have you ever seen someone try and catch a snake? Not to kill it. They're not trying to kill the snake, but they're just trying to, to catch it. For, for me, I... I have a healthy respect of snakes. I've seen and interacted with some deadly snakes while I spent some time in uh, West Africa. Uh, and snakes and I, we have a mutual understanding. We just, I'll leave them alone, they leave me alone, we can coexist and that's fine. Um, but have you ever seen someone try and catch a snake, again, not to kill it, but just to relocate it? How do they do it? They oftentimes will start and they come in low and slow, right? Because they don't want to move too quickly or otherwise the snake will notice they're there and it'll slither away, right? So they come in low and slow and they move in slowly and when they get to a point where they, the person knows there's no way this snake is getting away, what do they do? They grab the head. Why? They grab the head. Because when you can control the head, you can control the body. Where the head goes, the body goes as well. So if I'm walking our dog and I'm, I'm trying to walk Hudson, I put the collar around his neck, not his tail, right? Because that'll help direct. Because where the head goes, the body goes. 
So if you want to grab a snake, you don't grab it by the tail because it's going to whip right back up around and it's going to bite you. So you grab the head so you can control where it goes. If you control the head, you control the body, and the enemy knows this. 1 Peter 5.8 states, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. One of the enemy's greatest weapons is deception. One of the first things he goes for is the mind because he knows if he can control the head, he's got a pretty good shot at controlling all of you. What did he do in the garden? He came to Eve with deception, attacking the mind, planting doubts and false understandings. Deception plays a major role in spiritual warfare. This is why we read in Ephesians 6.11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We continue reading in 1 John chapter 2. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. To us. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. This is not saying if you leave neighborhood church and move that you are no longer a Christian. Just caveat, okay? If you move somewhere else, you're still you can still follow Christ. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. The author here is speaking in this context to these people of what he knows to be true about them. But part of the implication is they have walked away from God. Deception reveals those who are not saved. Deception reveals those who are not saved. I have to say this is the most heartbreaking part of this passage. Some of us may know people personally or even know of stories of people who have walked away from their faith. Now, there are many reasons that this could have happened, and I'm not standing up here to cast judgment in any form. But I know that this is a heart breaking place to be and a heartbreaking place to watch happen. And sometimes people have had legitimately hard things that they have wrestled through, but just unfortunately couldn't make it. And unfortunately for some people, sometimes things just got hard. Things just got uncomfortable. They fell to the deception that following Jesus is always and only good. Now, when we see someone walk away from their faith, it begs to ask the question, was their faith true to begin with? I am not standing here to answer that it poses a question. You have heard it said that God is good, right? Right? Okay. If you haven't, God is good. Okay? All right. You have heard it said that God is good, right? And he can only be good. Have you heard that? He can only be good, right? So if God is good and he can only be good, then following him must mean that nothing bad can ever happen to me ever again, right? 
If you have followed Christ for anything over 20 minutes, you know that that statement is not correct. Anything under 20 minutes, it might still be true. Um, Did you notice the truth in the statement? That God is good. And he can only be good. There is just enough truth to draw you in, finished with just enough lie to send you down the wrong path. Be aware of deception. It is easy to follow Jesus when things are easy, but when the going gets tough, where are you? Take a look at marriage, if you will. This concept would not work in a marriage. I'm here as long as everything is good, but if things start getting difficult or you start acting differently, I'm out. That's crazy, right? That's not a marriage. That's barely a friendship. It's not not a good friendship. Don't hear there's no way out of marriages. There are some times that there are legitimate reasons that a marriage needs to end. And there are biblical reasons why a marriage needs to end. But unfortunately today, it is far too often a legitimate and actual thought process of, if I don't like it, I'm out. Deception reveals those who are not saved. If you are truly in Christ, you may have difficult times. You will have difficult times, but you will never fully walk away. Ephesians 1.13 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, not see, seal, uh, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. With the youth, we just started a new series uh, looking at the Shema. Um, And I told you I'd talk about Bible product again. Doing it right now. Um, This is a video series. It's a six-week series through uh, the Bible Project where they look at the Shema. Uh, The Shema is an ancient Hebrew prayer um, prayed by people day and night. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I believe it's verses 4 and 5. Um, you, you might have heard it before. It, it starts, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, and, it, and it, it goes on. And so what we're doing is we're taking this prayer, and we're taking a look at six key words within the prayer and defining them and talking about that. And so this past week, we started with Shema, which is the very first word in the prayer. And it's here in this Translation, it's translated here, but the the Hebrew word Shema means listen. But this started an excellent conversation with with our students about the difference between hearing and listening. You see, listening involves action. It is one thing to sit in a chair every Sunday, half listening to the person up front while you think through what you, need, you want to do for lunch or the fact that the lawn needs mowing or the fact that you need to go to the grocery store or you need to finish your homework or you've got a presentation on Monday. And I'm not standing here in judgment. I, those examples were from myself, that I have sat here on Sunday mornings half hearing the person talking up front while I thought about things I needed to do the rest of the day. That's not listening. It's one thing to do that. It's another thing to listen to the word of God and let it sink in and transform the way that you live. This leads me into my third point this morning. Deception will disappear from the life of a believer. 
Deception will disappear from the life of a believer. We continue reading in 1 John chapter 2, uh, looking at verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie comes from the truth. As you let God's word and the anointing of the Holy Spirit work in your life, you start to see over time your ability to recognize deception in your life. Not only recognize deception, but also how to deal with it. The passage states, you have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. The one who puts their faith in Jesus Christ is given the gift of the Holy Spirit and is filled with God's truth. Warning. You will still struggle. You will still sin. You will still be deceived at times. But the more you soak yourself in God's truth, the less you'll find the struggles, the less you'll find the sin or the deceptions sticking. Deception can't live where truth resides. Deception can't live where truth resides. Confession time. How many of you guys like nachos? Nice. How many of you guys like that transition, huh? <laughs> Great. I love nachos. And I especially love when my wife makes nachos because she puts like the perfect amount of sour cream and salsa, even puts cilantro on there. The only thing that makes it a little bit better when I make it um, is the cheese. I put a lot more cheese. I'll just keep it going. Might need a second bag. Keep it going. See, I like nachos. When you go to grab one chip, you get six. That, those are some good nachos, right? But I'll be honest, after I or we have finished the plate, often when I make them and there's so much cheese, it, it, as it melts, it will go off and most of it will stick to the chips, but some of it makes it to the plate and sticks to the plate. And uh, depending, on, depending on how big the plate is when we finish it, sometimes I'll like scrape the cheese and sometimes I'm just too full. And so I leave the cheese. Uh, and I mean, I just ate a plate of nachos, so I'm not about to get up and do dishes. Um, so I'll go and I'll set the plate down. And I'll, you know, I'll wash it in the morning or the next morning. Probably, probably the morning after that. I'll, I'll wash it. See, at, by that time, that cheese that had melted on the plate is caked on there. You, like, you take a fork and you're trying to scrape it off and hope you don't scrape the plate, right? But see, I found a good trick on how to get that cheese off easier. If you let it soak for a little bit, you put some soap in there, let it soak for a little bit, and then after a little while, you come and you blast it with scalding hot water. That cheese slides right off. Right? You can write that down, put it in your pocket for later. Why am I talking about nachos? God's truth is like the scalding hot water. Sometimes deception and lies stick to us like that cheese to the plate. And sometimes they're things we tell ourselves. Sometimes they're things we've heard from other people. Sometimes they're just lies that came out of nowhere. But we let them stick to us. And some have been there long enough that they feel like they're a part of the original design. But if we soak ourselves in God's truth, 
that which is not of him washes away. When God's truth washes over us, nothing can stand in its way. Deception can't live where truth resides. We continue reading in 1 John chapter 2, we're at verses 22 and 23. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Deception denies the Father and the Son. Deception denies the Father and the Son. I had mentioned before that the author here is speaking in this context to these people of what he knows to be true about them. And he's reminding the reader that the Antichrist is anyone who denies Jesus. And anyone who denies the Son also denies the Father. They are a liar. They are a false teacher. And I'm not going to lie about the amount of anxiety that studying this part of the passage brought me as I prepared to teach this message. Reading and preparing to teach on the Antichrist really makes you take a hard look at your own life. I don't ever want to bring false hope or fake news about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. I don't ever want to lead people astray from Jesus. And I know the enemy is very good at what he does. He can bring the perfect amount of truth to bring you in and the perfect amount of lie to send you down the wrong path. And it, at first, it doesn't even need to be a dramatic path. That would be too noticeable. If the way to Jesus is this way, the way that the enemy leads you is this way. It's not the same. It's close. It's enough truth to keep you in, but enough lie to send you down the wrong path. And it might start small, but without the truth, before you know it, you're down a path you never thought you would go down, saying, how on earth did I get here? Deception denies the Father and the Son. And I hope and desire that I would teach you and our students and anyone truly the Jesus of the Bible and not a Jesus I created based on a deception. We continue on in, in 1 John chapter 2, 24 and 25. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. Point number five this morning is deception threatens eternal security. Deception threatens eternal security. We saw it earlier in the, in the message, and we're going to see it again now, John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The enemy knows he's already lost. He's not naive. He knows he's already lost, and he knows his time is limited. And at the end, he will fall. But his goal is to take as many people down with him as he can. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've talked so far this morning about how deception plays a major role in spiritual warfare. We've talked how deception reveals those who are not saved, how deception will disappear from the life of the believer. 
how deception denies the Father and the Son, and how deception threatens eternal security. My final point this morning. Deception needs to be called out. Deception needs to be called out. The last part of this passage, 1 John chapter 2, 26 and 27. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you, remain in him. Deception needs to be called out. When you see deception, name it. Identify it. Call it out for what it is. If you see someone being deceptive in grace and in love, talk with them. Part of Matthew 18 says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. There's more to that passage. Go and read it. It's important. If you see someone falling into deception in grace and in love, encourage them. Pray with them. James 5, 19 and 20 says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from their error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. God has already given us all that we need in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This passage says, you don't need anyone to teach you. Let me catch you right there, because I don't want to hear, uh, Pastor Mark, Tim showed us in the Bible where it says we don't need to listen to you because we already have the Holy Spirit. That's not what I'm saying, but great identifying the deception right off the bat. You're already putting it into use. Good job. This is not what this is saying. Hebrews 3.12 says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. I want to close with the three words that our passage closes with. Remain in him. We are at war may not be able to physically see the war happening, but we can certainly physically see the effects of it. Torin Wells has a, a song and the chorus says, on the mountains, I will bow my life to the one who set me there. In the valley, I will lift my eyes to see the one who sees me there. When I'm standing on the mountain, I didn't get there on my own. And when I'm walking through the valley, I know I'm not alone. You're the God of the hills and the valleys. He is still God through the highs and the lows. He is still good through the highs and the lows. Remain in him. Yes, Lord. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. As you're able, if you'll stand with us as we declare the words of come thou found. Every breath. 
blessing tune my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon it mount of thy I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering. Post his precious blood. How your kindness yet pursues me, how your mercy never fails me till the day that death shall lose me. I will. my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. And we know that your word contains truth that comes only from you. 
And there's times where we hear things that might be harder to understand or harder to comprehend, but we know that you put all your words together um, for our good, for our learning, and we thank you for the teaching this morning from your word and for the reminder that through all the things that may come our way, the good, the bad, the tryings, the trials, that we are encouraged to remain in you. And Lord, as we grow and as we are transformed by you, we just pray for opportunities to share that love that you give us with others. We pray for um, more light boxes to be um, lit in the coming months here at Neighborhood Church. And we pray that we can be instruments of shedding your love to others in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our places of work and, and outside. Thank you, Lord, for this time of worship. And we honor and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat for a few quick announcements. Uh, my name is Pam Homan. Thank you for joining us today at Neighborhood Church, where we are a people and a place being transformed by Jesus, empowered by his Holy Spirit, and launched on mission. There are connect cards and prayer cards in the seat backs in front of you and also online. Once those are completed, you can fill them or put them in the, in the box on your way out. If this is uh, your first time with us, you're newer to our community and live locally, we'd like to ask you to put your contact information uh, on one of those cards and we'll send you a gift this week as a thank you for joining us. Another way to connect is through our e-newsletter. So go to our website, neighborhoodc.org, to subscribe. Thank you as well for your generous giving. And that can also go in the box on your way out or also done online in one of the ways that you see on the screen. The Durwood Farmers Market is up and running and will run every Saturday from 9 to 1 through September 3rd. This is a major way that we can work together to show the love of Jesus in our community. Um, one, there are, for next week, there are two slots still needed to help with traffic during both shifts. Um, the main task there is to help pedestrians cross the street. You can see our website and sign up to fill one of those slots or others in the coming weeks ahead. I was uh, fortunate enough to serve at the farmer's market a couple weeks ago and just wanted to share with you that I had a really uh, wonderful time having a conversation with somebody that was in attendance. And you just never know what, what the Lord might bring or who the Lord might bring to have a conversation with you. And I realized afterwards, you know, this is probably one of the easiest places to share Jesus as we're just standing right outside of a church building and some of the times the conversation comes up naturally. So I want to encourage you to use those opportunities um, to serve. We're getting ready to recognize all high school and college graduates on June 5th, and we don't want to miss anyone. So if there is a graduate in your household, please send that information to the church office with a name, degree, and a picture. Parents, you have until 11.45 to pick up your kids. Um, thank you. It was so great to be together, and we look forward to seeing you again. Have a great week.